Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Owen Brazel. I work in MongoDB, and I'm going to introduce uh, task queues and workflows. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think, from what I've heard from talking to people today, seems to be a coming-of-age thing for many, many Python programmers where they, they meet salary at some point. So if you haven't, this is the perfect talk. Um, if you have, I'll probably cover a lot of stuff you already know. Um, so to start off, one of the things that you might find, whether you inherit code or whether you develop it, you might start off with a prototype. Sadly, it might go to production uh, before you're actually ready. Uh, and at a point, traffic starts coming, users start using it, and um, you suddenly hit some bottlenecks. So you're into the issue, the thorny issue of scalability. So I'm not going to cover uh, much about it, but I'm just going to say, what do you do normally? You throw a bigger box at it. So that would be scaling vertically. So uh, you might be pegged with your CPUs, you might be pegged with your RAM, and sometimes it's easy just to go up, let's say you're on Amazon, to the next instance type or a couple instance types up. Um, sometimes that isn't an option or the problem, and you just break it out across a number of similarly scaled, uh, similarly sized instances. So that's horizontal scaling. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about uh, a lot today. Um, when you have a, a web app or you have some long, complex program. Typically, if we look at a web app, it's a request. I'm requesting a web page. I'm getting a response. Um, and you're doing everything maybe in the, sorry. You're doing everything in the one uh, request. Um, and that can slow down your program. Um, so for instance, take a standard web app app. What's the most important part that people are going to come across? Say the registration. And if I want to ensure people use my web app, first thing I want to do is get them to register and then get that email with their details and the logon link to them ASAP. Uh, however, I might be calling other services to do that and it slows it down. So if I wanted to immediately show the registration page that you've successfully registered, but Prior to that in my program, I happen to have send you the email with your uh, link to your home page in the new web service. It'll all get delayed and the experience won't be optimal. Um, so one way of doing it is, you know, maybe put sending that email in a different request. That can scale to a certain point. However, um, in a lot of cases, those kind of requests could be dealt with asynchronously. And that's what the next part of the talk is going to talk about. It's going to be about queues and how you move that request out to a separate process completely. Um, a little later in the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, workflows. And I'm just going to get it clear uh, at the start here. So Celery deals with tasks. Uh, and when you have a sequence, a defined sequence of tasks, you have a workflow. So task A, task B, task C, and they follow in that sequence. Um, Celery is a really good tool for dealing with tasks and for simple workflows. As you move up, uh, Airflow is better, in my opinion, for some of the more complex requirements and dependencies you can have. Uh, behind those workflows. So Airflow is a Python system that was developed at Airbnb and they use it to power uh, their data warehouse. So it's a kind of traditional extract, uh, transform and load data from various sources into their data warehouse. And then uh, they also use it to run their AB experimentation. So if you see one Airbnb page and someone else sees a different one, you're in their experimental uh, stage and they use uh, Airflow to slice up the data they have and pick who gets that. Um, they also use it for a lot of reporting. So um, 
one of the things you might have is you might be pulling in your data and be running reports every night or every week or every month. Um, and Airflow is a really good system for that. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about that later on. I thought to start and try and uh, introduce Celery, I just walk briefly through um, a kind of rough diagram I put down. Celery has a lot of different components. Um, mainly you're interested in the app um, and you've got some work that you want to offload. Where does that go? So you're sending a task and it goes eventually to the worker which is the process that will do the work. But Celery doesn't work on its own. Celery uses uh, another messaging tool called RabbitMQ and Rabbit is literally the postman. It deals with the the handling of the message delivery um, between the application and the worker and it abstracts away a lot of that messaging. Um, Celery helps hide uh, a lot of that detail um, in simpler uh, functions so you don't need to worry about um, configuring MQP which is what Robert uses as its mess messaging protocol which can be quite complex and actually for the most part, it's something you don't really need to do much with. Um, it also allows you to have multiple queues. So on the, the slide here, I have one to N. And why would you want uh, multiple queues? So I gave the registration example where you might have uh, an email that you want to send and that might go on a slow queue. Or you might have a high priority queue where you want work to be done immediately. Um, in some cases uh, you might want to process video. We were talking earlier about folks replacing uh, images and stuff. But if you're doing video processing or something, maybe you want uh, different instances for those workers. So you want a high memory instance with lots of CPU power to do video transcoding. And you might set up a queue for that where the work goes to that worker for the video or the image processing. So as uh, the workers pull that uh, task, they work on it, whether it's sending the email, whether it's processing the video, and they store that in a task results uh, store. That can, if you want to persist it, it can be Redis, uh, it can be MongoDB, uh, and then the application calls result from that. And that, in general is the, the overview and sort of uh, top-down view on Celery and how it works and the different components. Um, focusing in a little bit, looking at tasks. Um, the task is the atomic piece of work in Celery. So it's the smallest unit that you're probably going to conceptually deal with. Um, it's got a... Uh, couple of things you should know. Tasks exist until they're acknowledged. So one of the things you might want to do is make sure it's either acknowledged or there's a, a time to live or it expires and I'll cover some of this later on. Um, you can also ignore the results. Maybe you only need some process to be done. You don't actually need the results of the processing back because the, the change in the state would be sufficient. The task has various states. So it can be pending uh, while we're waiting for work to be free. It can be received by a worker. It could be started but not finished. Or it could be successfully finished or it could fail. Um, tasks are defined very simply. They have kind of two styles, your standard Pythonic class or your standard Pythonic function. And here's a very simple example. And I'll just take a minute to walk down through it. It's one they use in their own docs and I'd recommend their docs because they're actually very approachable. Um, and this is a very simple function. It's an add function. It takes two parameters, X and Y, and it adds them. So uh, that's the top half of the slide. Looking to the bottom, this is how we'd call that in Celery. We would go add, apply underscore async, I'm going to su supply uh, some parameters for the first call, which is two and two. So that, w that task would return four, which is 
2 plus 2. And then I'm going to do a great thing about Teller. You can link tasks. So the 2 plus 2 is task A. Uh, and I'm going to link that with add S16. And what that will do is the result from the parent task, which is 2 and 2, will be fed in to the link. So it'll suddenly become, if the first task completes successfully, 4 plus 16. Um, so that is a very simple sort of chain of tasks. And there's uh, just the two tasks there. And you can add more complexity. I'm trying to keep this sort of relatively simple for the, the, the examples. And I'll use this example a few times. Um, but that's how you build up more complex tasks. And I suppose it's a, a good point to, to interject that it also shows it handles linking well, but maybe not some of the dependencies. And that's why I'll talk a little bit about um, Airflow later, because it can do that a little better. Uh, apply, I think, is the, the standard way of calling uh, the task. I'll follow on in the next slide with some, some more ways of calling it. Um, it allows you to do uh, some useful things like send various options. So the last line I have expires in 60 seconds and not retry this task. And that's literally maybe all you ever want. You want to say, how long is the result of this task valid for? And do I need to keep retrying it or not? Um, calling tasks, we've covered apply, I think. Delay is a shorthand for the same function it doesn't allow you to pass as many options. Calling is another way, and that just calls it in the parent. So if you're not distributing it to a worker uh, and you want to run it on the parent, that's how you do it. Again, maybe not exactly what you want to do when you're using the queues. We've covered linking. So that callback result is then applied uh, to the next task, and that was called a partial argument. Tasks have uh, a number of other um, options that are quite useful. So they have um, ETA. So what ETA allows you to do is say, at a certain point and after that, the task will run, which can be very useful. So say I don't want it to run before uh, my nightly job completes at 2 o'clock. Uh, I can schedule it immediately after that. Now, I have to make certain assumptions around that. Um, likewise, there's other options like uh, countdown. We've seen the expiration. Countdown is uh, a simple enough uh, integer setting. So I could say, run it in 60 seconds. Um, it allows you to serialize the messages, because one of the things you're doing here is you're moving um, these tasks uh, across the network for the most part. So this is, you're adding a layer of um, message passing. So one of the things to maybe be aware of is you're pulling out the task for maybe your primary program, but you are then involving the communication with the broker, communication with the worker, communication with from the worker to the, um, to being saved in the data store, and then back to the application. So there are some other um, things to be aware of there. Uh, however, for a lot of tasks, uh, this can be very useful. Uh, I'm sorry, for a lot of um, programs, this can be very useful, because by breaking it up into simpler tasks, unless you have some sort of quality of service that you need to meet, it can actually help. One of the reasons um, I started to look at this in the last few months was I inherited a code base. And it turned out that it was, in, uh, just to say, in, in need of using a queue. Uh, Celery was an ideal tool to allow me to break up work to an internal API and make hundreds of requests. And I'll show on the next page some of the, the other features that we've used to do that. Uh, respect internal API limits, and then 
get all of that outside of my program. So it's something that if I had done uh, as a set of requests in sequence using RESTful APIs might have taken five weeks to uh, return as I would walk uh, through a tree of them. Now takes a few hours. Tasks have uh, various other um, compression options that you can have. So if you're dealing with uh, a lot of information, and again, because you're passing it across, you're, you're balancing, what am I sending? JSON is the standard serialization format. So JSON may not have uh, all of the data uh, um, richness. So decimal and date time are, aren't well represented in that. So you might want to look at something if you have data uh, of that format that you need to transmit. Um, if you have, uh, let's say we're talking um, images or something, you might want to zip those because there might be a, a value in compressing that. Beyond this, I spoke a little bit about priorities. So you can have a very complex application and then you can use priorities and different queues to ensure you can actually uh, get certain high priority work uh, done first or jump the queue in essence. Um, workflows are sort of the next level up in Celery and these are the concepts where you can tie together the uh, task as a an atomic sort of unit into more complex groups. Um, so the primitives allow you to build those up into chains or chords, and uh, we'll cover them in the next slide. Oh, sorry, two slides. Uh, task signatures are um, ways of how you define the, the task. There's uh, Three you can cover, immutables are just tasks that you cannot change. Partials are ones that are uh, open to further definition in one sense, so you could add new options to them. And callbacks we've covered, they're uh, very simple. It's like the, the link where it takes the parental value, so two and two will be passed to 16. So we get uh, that example again on the add function. Looking at what can this do as I start to move into more complex uh, workflows, we have a, a very useful um, task primitive, which is groups. And Celery groups allow you to take a list of tasks that can be applied in parallel. So if you're uh, looking at web scraping, for instance, you could say, I want to scrape all of these pages. And it doesn't actually matter in what order, uh, none of the tasks will actually impact the other tasks. So if I take page A versus page Z, at the end I'm, I want everything between those two, but it's, it's not gonna make a difference at the ordering. So groups is the primitive that you can use to do that. And it's, it's very useful for, for that. Um, chains, we've already somewhat covered, it's where you use things like link, to link the signatures into a chain, so you can have task A, pass that, so that it'll, task B will call it, and you can add these together, building tasks up and the different functions of tasks into a more complex uh, workflow. Chords are a combination of these concepts. Um, and it's where you can have a bunch of what are defined as header tasks and uh, a body task. So a good example in the docs that they have is where I might uh, take uh, the sum of the first 100 numbers. Um, so add all of those together and then finally take the results of each of those 100 tasks and add them back together. And the adding them back together of those kind of last 100 tasks would be the body task. So I think one way to look at this outside of the Celery uh, terminology would be the body task is very similar to the reduce task conceptually in, in MapReduce. So you map out all of these tasks and then you bring them back. So if, if you're 
more familiar with MapReduce as a paradigm. There's there's quite a similarity conceptually on how you do that. Now, obviously, the, the implementation and the calls differ. But if you have MapReduce uh, or Hadoop experience uh, and are looking at Python, this might be a useful way to do it in Python and distribute the work. There are um, some other very useful um, primitives. Map is like a, the same as the Python built-in map. Uh, star map, I'll go back to the addition example. So if I call, uh, and it literally it just takes uh, arguments. Uh, so if I use the 2, 2, and 4, 4, say we'll call that the add.star map, so we're calling our add function again. Um, it will give a result which will be the result of the task A, the first task there, which is adding two and two, and the second task there, which is four and four, and it'll give those back. Um, that can be quite useful depending on how you're gonna uh, combine all of those and the ordering and sequence. So I think if you look at these primitives so far, one of the things you'll see is there's probably a lot of work yourself that you need to do around how you formulate a more complex workflow um, and bring these together for your own needs. So that's one thing I guess to say about Celery. It gives you the functions in the building blocks, but you do have a lot of work to do to pull them together. And the last um, task primitive, which is also very useful if you're thinking about web crawling, is uh, chunks. So if I decide to crawl 10 websites um, and I have 50,000 URLs, I might decide to do that in chunks of 1,000. Um, and chunks allows me to break that up into using that primitive into uh, you know, 100, 500, 1,000 instead of just sending it. Here's a, an array of those 100,000 requests. Please, please process that. Um, workers are the, the sort of the, the backbone of all this, and it's kind of funny in that salary is not just uh, defining when you define a task, defining the actual function in the task, it's also sending the options and instructing the worker around some of the uh, features you want to use. Uh, so it's abstracting away again. Uh, some of the advantages you get from using something like RabbitMQ, but simplifying it for your use. So if you want to retry, it's literally you're passing a, a Boolean. Uh, in the workers, there's a number of knobs and uh, dials that you can use. Um, there's various uh, concurrency settings. So depending on your workload, so if you have um, an IO-bound workload, you might want to use uh, Gevent or Eventlet to work with that if you've got a lot of requests. Again, if you happen to be doing a, uh, a web crawler. Concurrency is a somewhat of a rabbit hole and really depends on what you're trying to do. So um, I'm just going to literally echo what everyone else says. Uh, all of these dials are very useful, but be careful and try a couple of different uh, settings for your own uh, application and your own salary tasks. Um, workers also have some very useful features. They allow you to time limit a task. They allow you to rate limit a task. So um, if you're using another Teams or another service, so you've developed your service and you're looking to use Instagram or Twitter and you have paid for whatever usage of it, you may have an hourly or daily uh, limit. So you want to try and make sure that you don't send 10 times that limit and your service stops. So one of the ways to do that is somewhat throttle it through API uh, rate limiting. And you can do that um, both at a worker level and at a task level, like one of the advantages of salary is the limits that I talk about primarily here for, for those can be set not just at the worker, but they can also be set at the task. So I can have some functions uh, that I will let rip and have no uh, limits on, and others that maybe I have much tighter limits on. 
Um, there are other useful limits for workers. You can set the max number of tasks that a worker will run on the max memory. If you're having leakage issues, um, setting the max memory might be useful to kind of stop it and then restart the worker. Um, the queues we've kind of covered. Uh, one of the features uh, that Celery offers is auto scaling. So people may use auto scaling in Amazon, it's a kind of similar concept. You might start with a smaller pool of workers and say, depending on the amount of work you have uh, coming in, then scale up to an upper limit. And Celery supports that with auto scaling. Um, um, and just that the final side on um, Celery is how do you do uh, scheduling? Scheduling is probably. Um, more important as you move to the complex workflows, I want to do something at a specific time or in a specific amount of time. Um, Celery allows you to write your own custom scheduler. It comes out of the box with Celery Beat. Um, Heroku have this summer released their own uh, version of the uh, scheduler. Uh, they had issues with Celery Beat. Um, they released their uh, version called Red Beat. Uh, and depending, you know, you might look at that, it uses Redis as its back end. And the real issue with both the custom scheduler and Celery Beat was that every time there were changes, everything had to be reloaded. And that actually caused a delay for them. Uh, and it was noticeable across them because they use Celery for uh, quite a number of things. but. Uh, particularly, they were talking about how they use Celery to take data in Heroku Connect between Salesforce and the, the Heroku platform. Uh, Heroku is kind of um, one of the earlier uh, ideas of the 12-factor app, where you um, basically spin up a Dynamo that just is literally running your application, if you're, you're not familiar. It's a very... Um, useful testbed environment and production for certain scale of, of uh, user. Um, I'm going to take and hopefully show just one example system and I'll show a teeny bit of code of something in reality rather than try and give a demo. But just a, a rough show of hands, has anyone here taken a Coursera or open edX or any sort of massively on a massively uh, open a MOOC, I think they're they're properly called. Yeah, I can I can see hands. Actually, Celery is a really good system for a lot of that because what happens if I do my introduction to Python course and two hundred thousand people sign up? You know, it's the internet. This this happens these days. What happens? How do I? calculate the grades for that. Hell, how do I send all the emails? Um, you need something like a queue system uh, where you can dispatch all this out. So Open edX is the Harvard MIT system. It kind of great to be talking about it here. It's a Django system. Uh, and it also uses Celery. So if you're interested in some of the Django testing talk earlier or some of the other parts around Django, it's a good, real, big system in use and day to day to have a look at. Um, so I'm going to try now and bear with me as um, I'm sure I'm going to have IT issues. I always do. Um, and go to Nope. Sorry. Wrong window. I'll put my deck up later and you'll have all the links that are embedded in it. Um, I'm just going to walk through a couple of the example ones here. So this, don't try and read it. Uh, this is the module they use to calculate their um, grades. You can, uh, you can see it's somewhat complicated as all big systems are. But here's the base task, here's salary. And it's computing the grades for a course. It's batching it and having an offset. So do from zero to 
X and I might be doing it in increments of 500 students and move that window through. Um, This is their um, core structure uh, celery task, I should say. Celery, uh, the convention is to use task.py. So if you ever want to search GitHub looking in a Python project for task.py, you normally find uh, the celery functions in there if, if, if it is using celery. Um, and then uh, this example is um, for the instructor. So if I want to regrade a module, uh, I want to recalculate store, uh, scores, I want to change the, the course average, um, I want to remove a, a test or a quiz, um, you can do all of that and it's all done through Celery. And I guess one of the points to say is because there's a lot of um, interaction then with the database and all this, this is all quite slow and you don't want the instructors web page to be locked for, I don't know, days as, uh, as it goes on to do this kind of task because when you're dealing with, you know, in some of the artificial intelligence courses, it could be uh, 200,000 people will sign up now. Um, if I can. So I gave three examples there, the grades, course structure, instructor tasks. There are six in the, the slides, you can walk through them uh, and have a look at some good examples of how you might use it to deal with that kind of system. Now to cover Airflow, um, like I said, Airflow is really the orchestration uh, part of tasks and that's its focus. Celery looks at tasks and looks at more simpler Workflows. Airflow is really looking at the bigger orchestration picture, um, and there's a little bit of overlap. Um, Airflow allows many different types of workers, and they kind of use a, a similar uh, terminology. Airflow um, calls them executors, but in essence, uh, a, a salary executor in Airflow is a salary worker in salary. It's just the uh, difference in terminology. Airflow um, allows you uh, to use a very nice UI, uh, has a nice metadata DB, um, has lovely charting and other stuff on top of the fact that uh, you can define in purely programmatic fashion a uh, directed acyclic graph as your atomic object of work and that allows you to look at more complex dependencies between those tasks. So not just at the workflow level, but at the task level. So the criteria between task A and task B can be more complex than um, at least I've been able to code in Celery. I'd be happy to be corrected by anyone here. Um, Airflow, um, like I, I mentioned earlier, was designed for extract transform and load scenarios. So where you take data for a variety of data sources and in essence pool them into a single data warehouse before you do different uh, jobs on it. Um, in some cases like uh, that's the, the base case, they've moved it on uh, to support a lot of their machine learning and data pipeline generation. So a lot of their experimentation as I said works off this and this is where the importance of that uh, acyclic graph and having those dependencies means that uh, B in this task example can only run after A has run successfully but C may be able to run at any time and it has the richness of the language to allow you to do that. Um, I mentioned this already but literally the only change to use the Celery backend um, with Airflow is to point your Airflow config file uh, to your salary and that's assuming you have your RabbitMQ and everything else set up. Here's an overview of Airflow. Um, 
It has a couple of components uh, sort of that differ from uh, Celery because of its focus. And its focus and its audience and users um, are maybe more uh, data analysts and those working on ETL originally and now those in the data science side. So it was really concerned about providing a good UI, allowing people to create those workflows and also scheduling them. And the scheduling part is really the core part of the orchestration that uh, it focuses on. Uh, it also has um, some other nice features. So I didn't cover Celery Flower um, in the Celery section. Celery Flower is the management and sort of monitoring UI that's bundled with Celery, and you can use that to monitor your tasks and your queues. It's very useful um, if you're trying to debug something. Um, Airflow has uh, similarly a you know a database metadata store behind it. Uh, it uses queuing again. D again, it depends on uh, what executor you're using. If this was a Celery executor, you could simply pull in the diagram I had for Celery and plop it down there because it would literally be uh, RabbitMQ and Celery workers. So I've ab abstracted this a little bit. It also allows you to do things that you might see in a more enterprise uh, environment like Kerberos tickets, and it has um, command line options for you to easily add that type of security into your system. And again, if you're in a data warehouse, you probably are gonna have some uh, data you don't wanna be too easily accessible. Um, Airflow has a couple of concepts, the directed acidic graph which controls the ordering of how things go, uh, the operators which are how the work is performed, the task is just an instance of the operator, and then the task instance um, which is assigned to your graph but more sort of um, particularly to keep in mind in your mental model of Airflow, that's associated with a specific run of the uh, DAG and it's that orchestration and when will it run that I suppose is different to Celery and it forces the airflow model on how you orchestrate tasks and there are some pluses and minuses with that. Um, in some cases you have to be careful with airflow because uh, you might need to use things like the short circuit operator to avoid multiply rerunning a task over and over again for no real um, advantage. Um, but it depends on your your uh, your requirements, I guess. Um, it offers uh, sub DAGs, so you can have uh, you can again break up that graph and those tasks into smaller sets. It has nice things like uh, service level agreements, which I think is the first time I've seen this in a system like this, where you can actually uh, implement those and those triggers. Um, and various hooks. Uh, it has quite a number of community and third party backend. So one of the things you'll see uh, a lot of people doing is uh, taking data locally, doing the processing, and then maybe, maybe moving it from Hive to S3 through some of their own uh, database at some point. Um, so it has a, a, like a wide selection of, uh, I think, um, at least a dozen I can think of off the top of my head, uh, database interfaces, um, which is quite useful then, particularly as you're thinking of, if in a data warehouse situation, of bringing data from disparate sources uh, and performing things like reporting. Um, so uh, just to uh, sort of summarize and finish up, I could give pluses and minuses. I actually think it's easier to see um, a couple of the examples that other people use it for. Um, salary is a good uh, use if you're immediately hitting a RAM or a CPU issue. Um, it can move that task out of the function and move it away um, at a very low level sort of problem. Um, there's a nice uh, open source example on GitHub of a system called ORES, and that's machine learning as a service, and that's backed by Celery. So if I have a training job 
or classification job, I can push that to uh, Celery to perform the task and the functions are defined within that. Um, if I'm using social media in a web page, if I'm pulling in feeds, if I'm doing deletions, if I'm doing spam, um, and one of the sort of examples and bigger users and known users of Celery would be Instagram. So they use this, and this is how they've um, managed to scale their system. Um, looking at Airflow, um, I've covered uh, ETL jobs a lot. Uh, there's a nice link there to Astronomer, and a couple of posts they have that are linked to that on why they use it for uh, ETL. Um, Robinhood is another company that uses for batch jobs. I guess one of the things to say about Airflow um, is that if you move beyond cron and you have um, needs for something more complex uh, outside of just a simple cron job, Airflow is probably a good thing to investigate. And this is they talk about this uh, in that post. Um, and to finish. The, there's two sub-bullets on each of those. Uh, the first one is the user guide for both of the tools, and the second one is the user groups. They're both uh, quite um, open, and there's a lot of posting on it. So the projects are quite active. So um, if you do go to use it, feel free to reach out and talk to me, or uh, talk to the user groups online. And uh, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>